rest of our country. Uh, thanks for joining us this Friday afternoon and or morning for a discussion on caterpillars. Um, just some real quick uh, housekeeping items. Uh, you do get ISA credits for this webinar. So if you see over on the right-hand corner of your screen, you have something that looks like this. If you click on that little arrow, it will expand out a dialog box. So if you have not put in your ISA um, uh, credit number or your ISA number uh, while registering for us, you can put it in now right there. Uh, likewise, and right there in the questions field, so expand that questions field, you can put it in there. Um, likewise, uh, if you have any questions that arise during our webinar, you can put those questions in there, and we have some time allotted at the end of this um, discussion today to go through those questions. So we'll address any questions you may have um, at the end of the webinar. Uh, my name, this, uh, this voice coming through your computer this morning and or afternoon, uh, my name is Patrick Anderson. Um, I'm a board certified master arborist, municipal specialist, and a registered consulting arborist. Uh, my job is to do tech support and training for our clients. So for those of you um, in the audience today, um, I am part of our tech support team. So at any time, you can email me, call me direct, or of course, you can always call our tech support line where we can get you information on products, protocols, uh, timing of treatments, rates, anything like that. Um, that's what we are here for you. Uh, and to help out with. Um, and of course, Rainbow, our big approach at Rainbow is we are based in science. So everything that we offer to, to you out there in the field is based on peer-reviewed good science and research. And of course, we take this, we put this into practical protocols that we then, of course, train you on, offer technical support so that we can give you a nice, healthy tree. And of course, part of what we also do is we want to help you, of course, market these um, great things that we can do to help trees. So we offer a lot when it comes to marketing uh, support and materials. So once again, you can help to bring this to your customers. And not only do we have healthy trees, but we have repeat customers. And that's, that's just a great thing. And that's what we really want to help you do. We want to be your partner in plant health care. Um, as I mentioned, we have a, a, a long history of doing uh, research and development activities. So we're one of the very few um, privately owned companies that do full-time research and development on issues in our field. So issues specifically around tree and shrub care. And just last year, 2015, we did over 95 research trials uh, with a host of, of cooperators to bring really sound scientific uh, results and knowledge to our field, the field of arboriculture and landscape management. Uh, but today we're here to talk about caterpillars. Um, I'm a big fan of caterpillars. Um, you know, I, I've always thought they're very beautiful, and of course they become very pretty butterflies and moths. So we're going to talk about what is a caterpillar, the features of caterpillars. We're going to talk about the life cycle of some, some of the common caterpillar pests throughout the country, uh, and then we're going to talk about practical protocols for managing these caterpillars, specifically around um, alternatives to spraying. So we won't talk too much about products for spraying, but we will talk about some products that we can use to offer predictable results when treating for caterpillars. Uh, but first off, of course, what is a caterpillar? And who doesn't love uh, any presentation that begins with a definition? Uh, caterpillar is the common name for the larva of members of the order Lepidoptera. Uh, so again, these are the, the insects that are going to be comprise our butterflies and moths. And if we see here, if we take, and that's just stole this right from Wikipedia, uh, if we see here, we have a plethora of uh, Lepidopteran species throughout the, uh, the country here, throughout the world rather. So we have a lot of different uh, caterpillar species, Lepidopteran species, and here's one of my favorite. This was taken in Charlotte, North Carolina, one of a pink striped oak worm. Uh, just an interesting looking critter there, uh, some of my favorites. So a little bit more about what caterpillars are. Um, not all wormy looking things are caterpillars. And one place where we see um, a breakdown of diagnosis is between the sawflies and the caterpillars. So sawflies are in a different order than caterpillars. They're actually more closely related to wasps and bees and, and things like that. And it's a key distinction to know the difference between a sawfly and a caterpillar because it's going to dictate our protocol. Uh, and namely, with sawflies, sawflies we can treat very easily with things like imidacloprid, 
whereas imidacloprid is not a very good um, product for caterpillars. And so the, the number one way we can tell a caterpillar larva, like this guy here, from a sawfly larva, like this guy here, are to count its prolegs. And its prolegs are basically these little nubby legs that are on the, uh, the back side, the, uh, the rear portions of the larva. And so with sawflies, sawflies are always going to have six or more sets of prolegs. So if we count these little nubby legs here, if we have more than six pairs, we know we have a sawfly. Now that is different than caterpillars. Caterpillars will always have five pairs or less of prolegs. So in this case here, this guy only has two little nubs, so we know he's a caterpillar pest, and this is a little tiny canker worm here, again, taken to short North Carolina, uh, versus here our sawfly, uh, which this year I got from the uh, Wiki Commons website, uh, which has a lot of great pictures that you can use and refer to. Um, so what do caterpillars eat? We know the caterpillars are often um, uh, leaf eaters. They're, they're herbivores, but there are some really interesting caterpillars out there that are actually carnivores. And here we have a picture, this is from um, Andrew uh, Warren down in, in uh, Florida, of a harvester caterpillar actually eating aphids. So I'm not sure how many people knew this, but we do have some, some species of caterpillars that actually can be beneficial and actually feed on some of these plant pests that we're often managing. Uh, another interesting uh, kind of thing about caterpillars is sometimes they can be omnivorous. And in the case specifically here of monarch caterpillars, uh, when they're faced with a food shortage, so if they eat all the leaves of their host plant, they'll actually start eating each other. So big monarch caterpillars will eat little monarch caterpillars when they run out of food, uh, which is kind of just interesting and weird and just a, a lovely thing about caterpillars. Um, and of course, caterpillars, they go through what we call a complete metamorphosis. So lepidopterans go through what we call complete metamorphosis, which means they start out as an egg and they hatch, and then they go through several instar stages. So several, they go from being a small caterpillar to a little bit bigger caterpillar to finally a mature caterpillar. Uh, then they go through some kind of a, uh, a phase here where they turn into a pupa, and then they, of course, become uh, a moth or butterfly. And moths and butterflies, as we know, are, they play a huge environmental role, uh, especially in pollinating a lot of our different um, species out there. They're, they're a great uh, pollinator. Of course, they're attracted to uh, very colorful flowers that produce nectar. And they are, of course, are there to feed upon the nectar, but inadvertently then, of course, go ahead and, um, and transfer that pollen around to create more plants and flowers for us. And so most of the time, there we see butterflies during the day. So often when we see something like this, it's a butterfly feeding during the day. But then there's also uh, moths are actually our pollinators for the evenings. So we'll have moth species. Some will feed during the day, but our moth species are out there at night uh, with bats uh, helping to pollinate some of our flowers at night. <clears throat> now here's another interesting little thing um, is that some of these are very, very uh, specific. So for instance, with um, some species of yucca, some species of yucca are 100% uh, relied upon this little yucca moth to pollinate. So without yucca moths, some species of yucca would just not continue to produce, um, which would be a shame. Uh, now here's another weird little thing. Um, some, some, like this little guy here, known as the vampire moth, can actually feed upon the blood of vertebrates. Um, which is kind of creepy to think about, uh, this kind of giant mothy thing landing on you and sucking your blood. But don't worry about that. Uh, we don't have too many of them here in the U.S. and nothing to be concerned about. But just an interesting little fact about moths. Um, now going back to the caterpillars, caterpillars, you know, again, from an environmental sense, these guys are a major food source for a lot of our songbirds. And, you know, I know many arborists who are birders. Um, I know many of our clients are birds, and of course they're trying to attract um, birds to, um, to to our, our backyard so we can enjoy them and their songs and, and their beauty. And of course, um, you know, especially during the time that their chicks are hatching, uh, caterpillars play a major protein source for a lot of these songbirds. And here we have a picture of a little tiny, this is a Carolina chickadee uh, feasting on a canker worm that he'll kind of eat up and then kind of regurgitate into his this chick's mouths there. 
Um, so caterpillars are, are a huge food source for birds, and a reason why, you know, not all caterpillars are bad. Some caterpillars, are just, they, they, they provide a lot of benefits to us, and of course those butterflies prevent, or excuse me, cause a whole lot of great um, benefits for us. So just because you have a caterpillar doesn't mean they're all bad. And we have a lot of different species of caterpillars out there that really aren't causing that much harm to anything. And just really, I mean, if you're like me and you like caterpillars and taking pictures of caterpillars, there's just some really brilliantly looking cool caterpillars out there that are just not causing us too much harm, just out there kind of hanging out and doing their thing and, and being really neat looking. Um, so I like, again, I like caterpillars. I spend a lot of time tracking caterpillars down. But now that being said, we do know that we have some species that can cause tremendous amounts of harm. Um, some can cause severe harm to trees. Some can just make trees look ugly. And of course, you know, a lot of our clients, are, they want, of course, beautiful landscapes. They don't want things like tent caterpillars with all this webbing on the tree that then, of course, defoliates plants. We have bagworms that we know can outright kill some trees. Um, we think have things like canker worms and leaf rollers that come out in the spring and cause a lot of damage. And then we have some of these things like the orange striped oak worm, kind of like a pink striped oak worm from earlier, that is just a nuisance pest because they leave these very large poops basically on the ground. And again, our clients don't want to see that. So we do have some course for managing caterpillars um, often in, in many of our landscapes. And now, of course, you know, this being said, I always like to refer to this, you know, um, this method of PHC or this appropriate response process where, you know, we are monitoring, diagnosing, and preventing these things and, and monitoring to know what kind of species of caterpillars we have. Again, knowing that they're, they're not all bad and that they will eventually become butterflies or moths that are going to help pollinate our flowers and that they can be food source for some of these, um, you know, vertebrates that we love to see in our landscapes. Um, you know, making sure that we're doing the right thing and not just kind of pulling the, the, the trigger here and just going ahead and controlling it because we have a moth out there on our, our uh, site there. And of course, you know, a moth, a, a lepidopteran's life cycle is important when it comes to treating as well. So, so we're not just out there spraying willy-nilly, uh, just trying to get all of our, our insects, doing our appropriate response process, identifying the pest that we are trying to, um, to get, and then identifying its life cycle so that we can apply our products appropriately. And so we can do this through the use of growing degree days. And the growing degree day is basically it's the measure of heat accumulation used by horticulturalists, gardeners, and farmers to protect plant and animal development rates, <clears throat> excuse me, um, such as when certain insects become um, uh, out, when they come out and they are uh, susceptible to our treatments. So here, this is a, a sample from a growing degree day chart from, uh, this is from Ohio State. And we can see here bagworm. Bagworm begins to emerge. The larvae of bagworm begin to emerge between 600 and 900 growing degree days. And so this is when we want to be monitoring and beginning our treatments for bagworm in this case. We won't want to be out there much before that because then our, our products would just go to naught. The, the bagworm would be active and we wouldn't achieve control. And likewise, as that bagworm gets older and matures, uh, we're not going to have as great success with our treatment. So managing, monitoring our growing degree days based upon the life cycle of our pest uh, is important. Likewise here, you know, we see we have a, a uh, equation to come up with growing degree days, and I, this is great. What I always say to people, just go to the internet. There are plenty of growing degree day calculators out there. This is through NC State. And basically what you would do is you would click on one of these control points. You would put in a date range and it'll tell you what your growing degree days is. So you can match that to your growing degree day charts and um, really help you to tune in on when these treatments should be done or need to be done for some of our tests. Likewise, we can use um, utilize phenology. So phenology is the study of periodic plant and animal life cycle events and how these are influenced by seasonal uh, and interannual variations. And so basically what we can do, what horticulturists for, for probably centuries have been utilizing this phenology where they tie the either the, the life event of a plant, whether it be flowering or leaf out, um, to when a certain pest is active. And there's a lot of really cool, cool, um, charts and things out there uh, to time these things. There's this book here called Coincide that ties phenological events such as, again, the flowering of certain common landscape plants to when the susceptible phase of certain pests are, are going to be active. So there's a lot of really neat things we can do with phenology. 
And as we get into these, some of these common pest problems, we can take a look at this, this phenology here and how it ties in. So here, you know, we'll, we'll kind of look, take a step and we'll look at some of the most common pests out there, caterpillar pests that we can be found throughout our country. Of course, this is not exhaustive, um, but here are some of the ones that we find that are most often damaging plants around the country. And we start here with bagworm. Bagworm can be found everywhere. It can really be in high populations. It can really be a tragic pest because as we know, bagworm really likes to feed upon some of these scale leaf and needle evergreens. And we know that depending upon the species and the amount of damage, we often will not get leaf out or you know enough leaf out uh, after defoliation to make the plant worth its while anymore. And you know often, these types of plants, these scale leaf needle evergreens, things like junipers and Leyland cypress, are often planted as screen plantings. And of course, if we lose all our leaves and then the plant is unable to, to leaf back out, then really it's, it's been eliminated from the landscape. Its usefulness has been eliminated because, uh, well, again, it's, it's there for a screen and now we no longer have a screen. We just have brown sticks, which is, which is real shame. So bagworm, of course, will affect many species, often found on these scale leaf and needle evergreens like Leyland cypress, juniper, pines, spruces, things of that nature. Uh, from a growing degree day type thing, again, yellow, we expect um, bagworm to hatch, depending upon where you are in the country, around the time yucca blooms or around the time the yellow would bloom. And so you can use this as a management strategy as you're driving around and you see yellowwoods beginning to bloom, you know, hey, I'd better start monitoring for bagworm and I better get ready to start treating for bagworm to treat that first phase when they're active and I can get them while they're still young and before they've done any damage. Because really, the, it's, it's cool to use this growing degree day phenology stuff because you can target the pest before they even cause the damage. So you're not getting those phone calls. You can, you can plan as opposed to react to a lot of these things. Uh, and this, again, is things you can put in your marketing. Uh, so again, you're letting your clients know when you need to be there for them, uh, uh, waiting for them to call you. Um, so bad ones are interesting um, in that the female, you know, they know they, they hatch from their eggs. They, their eggs are laid in these actual bags and they hatch and they go and they start creating these bags from the debris around them. And that's really what this bag is, is just a, a, a combination of webbing and debris that the caterpillar puts around it to hide it from predators and to help it to blend in. Um, but as they pupate, the females never leave those bags. The males um, will find the female, so they will pupate, they will leave their bag, they will fly, they will fed, they find the female, they will mate with the female, and then the female lays the eggs in that bag and they die. And that's it, that's their life cycle. And that's one generation a year. And again, we expect those eggs to hatch uh, here kind of mid-spring-ish, 700 to 800 growing degree days, 600 to 800 growing degree days, uh, around the time that yucca or yellow would be blooming. That would be our key time to treat, begin treating or tr begin monitoring for bagworms. Moving on, we have gypsy moth. Gypsy moth is a huge issue, especially on the, the East Coast. And part of it, because when their their peak feeding begins right here in June is when really they're peak feeding occurs on the East Coast. And this is very detrimental because this is starting to approach, approach you know, late spring into summer where um, a plant really needs a lot of folks in the area to bring in as much nutrient or to, to create as much energy for itself as possible. And by reducing that photosynthetic area right in that prime time, right when you know those leaves have just finally matured and they're really collecting all that sun, can be really detrimental um, to a plant. <clears throat> so if we look at, you know, again, their hosts, they attack a lot of species. Um, oaks and maples are the ones that we see uh, really devastated on the East Coast. And again, the forest situation could be a real, real issue for these poor trees, along with other species. I've seen gypsy moth defoliating spruce trees, which is pretty crazy. Uh, but they certainly, if they're hungry, they'll eat on just about everything. Again, these guys have one generation a year. Uh, they come, they begin hatching, they begin to hatch early on, um, but your best time to apply apps uh, is around that 200 to 350 growing degree days, um, around the time that Van Houtii spirea begins to bloom, depending upon where you are in the country there. And again, so they emerge, they start emerging in May, and they start kind of feeding just a little bit, and then they go through over a month where they're feeding, so 40 days, that's a long time for something like this to be feeding and just doing so much damage. 
Um, and again, this is where you see the bulk of your defoliation is here later on in that spring, early summer, that's just so damaging to the plant. And then, of course, they go through a pupation uh, phase there. And then similar kind of to our bagworm, the females don't have, they don't, they have wings, but they don't fly. Um, so they crawl up the tree, the male finds them, they mate, and then they leave um, their egg mass. And that is very characteristic there of a, um, a gypsy moth infestation. When you see these kind of light tannish egg masses on the tree, that's, that's a sign that you're going to have those guys there. And then they overwinter in that egg mass and then come back out there in May. And this distinguishing factor here with identifying these versus other caterpillars, because there are caterpillars that are fully benign, but do look a lot like gypsy moth. And I'll also mention gypsy moth is a, not a native species. It was introduced uh, for silk production, and uh, well, they escaped, and, and that's it. Um, but here, when we have a, uh, a larger caterpillar, we can distinguish it between as five pairs of blue dots up by its head, and then six pairs of red dots going down its back. And that's how we can distinguish a gypsy moth caterpillar, which can be devastating and is not a native pest, to some of these other kind of benign caterpillars that we can find out about the same time. Um, interesting little guy. Uh, the next one we'll look at here is mimosa webworm. And of course, these guys affect mimosa, uh, which some people you know, usually aren't too stressed out about. But you know, honey locust, which is commonly planted as an ornamental tree throughout the US here, you can find it on honey locust. And it can really make a honey locust look really, I mean, it can look, make a mimosa look ugly as well. But it can make these plants look really, really ugly. Uh, and so what they do is they create this web and they fold in the leaves and then they feed on the leaves within their web and that kind of grows and grows until I see entire trees just completely covered by these mimosa webworms, um, which again just make them look really ugly. Um, these guys can have two generations a year. So for applications, if we're not using something like a systemic that has a long-term um, uh, activity period in the tree, we have to uh, treat twice possibly to get full control and so that first again that first kind of um, uh, those first instars of that first generation start coming out about yucca or yellowwood bloom which again depending upon where you are is going to be um, later on in the spring and then we can expect another generation uh, usually around August or so um, so these guys again these can be a big deal throughout the country they really make a tree look ugly um, a nasty little pest. Um, fall webworm here. This is another one of these pests that it's not really doing all that much damage to the tree, but our clients just don't like to see all of these, you know, these these webs, these bags of webs hanging out on the branch tips there. Uh, now that being said, I have seen places again in, in the um, the Midwest. Uh, I'm thinking this specifically in Oklahoma where these guys have just completely decimated the tree. It's, it's pretty crazy where the entire tree is just covered in this, this webbing. Uh, it's pretty wild stuff. Uh, we see these guys commonly on walnuts, pecans, uh, cherry species, our hickories, and our crab apples seem to get uh, hit the worst by these guys. And depending upon where you are, now here's another sticky one here, is uh, they can have up to three generations. So the further south we get, the more generations of these guys we got to get. And that's something, of course, important to know uh, for our treatment policies here. And so that first generation usually comes out around the time um, our hydrangea paniculata grandiflora is blooming white. So that's about 1,800 to 2,100 growing degree days. So again, depending upon where you are, you know, in the Carolinas and South, this might start as early as June. Ironically, we call them fall webworm. Um, but it might start as early as June, and then, you know, again, if we have a long growing season, some parts of the country, again, that definitely will have a long growing season. We can see these guys feeding up in through September and October. Um, so these guys can be tricky. Again, generally not a big issue from a plant health standpoint, but they can definitely make plant look ugly. Um, you know, in small populations or isolated populations on a tree, we can simply just prune them off if we can, you know, with a hand snip, and we've done that plenty of times. Um, but again, a, a pest that we often see hanging out around um, in many parts of our country. Uh, Eastern tent caterpillar and forest tent caterpillar. Uh, as I'm driving around right now, again, in North Carolina is where I am today, and uh, I'm starting to see these guys out on trees right now. And so I always want to bring these up. There's, there's two types of tent caterpillars, and sometimes people confuse them. 
but we have eastern tent caterpillar and forest tent caterpillar. And our eastern tent caterpillar, that's the one that forms these little webbing nests where you see these webs formed in the crotch of the tree and then they will venture out and feed and go back into their little nest here. Uh, that is eastern tent caterpillar. And that is often, it can be confused sometimes with forest tent caterpillar. Forest tent caterpillar doesn't create these little tiny nests. They just, they, they feed independently. And again, these guys are really, I think they're really pretty. Uh, maybe I'm strange for that. But the difference between the eastern and the forest tent caterpillar is the forest tent caterpillar has this series of what look like keyholes down their backs. Whereas an eastern tent caterpillar has this straight white uh, back here. And again, your eastern tent caterpillar are going to form those, uh, those webs, which of course are ugly. Uh, clients don't really like to see them. And they can, of course, they can do some pretty significant defoliation on some plants as well, which is something to, to of course, be concerned about. Um, but again, likewise, when you see them, when they're this, you can see these guys are tiny little uh, guys in here. And when you get this, you can simply just destroy that nest, and that'll disrupt the feeding of those guys here. Uh, we see these guys often on hawthorn, cherry, plum, crab apple. Uh, and again, these guys have one generation a year. They come out early. Uh, these guys will appear around the time for Scythia flowers, so 100, 200 growing degree days. So pretty early in the years when we see these guys. Uh, and then, of course, it's a little bit later on that we actually start seeing the damage, uh, again, later on in the May there. Um, so really interesting uh, pest there. Um, and then we have, of course, uh, canker worm, fall and spring canker worm. Uh, these guys usually, in most parts of the country, are usually just a, not a big deal. And actually, you know, there are these little tiny inchworms. So, you know, oftentimes, you know, we see these cute little things inching around and people think they're adorable and, and cute and I don't blame them. But in some parts of the country, again, namely here in the, the Charlotte area and other parts down in the southeast, we can get massive defoliation of very large trees by canker worm. Uh, spring and fall canker worm. And these guys are another one of these kind of unique species where the female doesn't even have wings. So we can hear this is a fall canker worm. This picture is taken in the dead of winter. The fall canker worms, the females will hatch. They pupate underground and they'll hatch in, in late fall, early winter. And so again, in Charlotte, we often see these guys coming out in December. And these females are gray, dull-looking little things with no, no wings. And they will crawl all the way up a tree into the tips, and they'll lay their eggs. They'll, 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 the males have wings. They'll find them. They'll mate. Then they'll lay their eggs. And those eggs will sit there until very early on in the spring. And so this is usually time around the time willow oak buds will break. Again, very early. Uh, they start out as tiny, tiny little things you can barely see. But by the time they mature and they've fed for, again, a substantial period of time over a month they can do some serious damage and we see them a lot on our oaks our maples our dogwoods i don't have them written here but cherry is another one that they just go to town on especially our ornamental cherries uh, so an interesting pest um, these guys are one of these things people will put bands sticky bands around the trees to catch the females on their way up people i failed to mention that is also a treatment strategy for some people with um Gypsy moth. Some people will put sticky bands around the trees to catch those females because, again, those females don't fly. They crawl. Um, similarly here to our, our canker worms here, those females, they don't fly. They crawl. So you can actually catch those females before they get up into the crown, mate, and lay eggs. So that's a treatment strategy for a lot of people here. Of course, in very large populations, sometimes that, that will break down that treatment strategy. So we know for years, um, we've been treating our caterpillar pests with foliar sprays. And we have a whole bunch of different, uh, really, spray compounds that we can use. We have our uh, acelopran, and I didn't spell check. And uh, so you can see that is, that is active ingredient is wholly spelled wrong. I apologize for that. Um, so we have our acelopran. We have spinosad, so it's conserved. We have our uh, pyrethrins, our bifenthrin, and permethrin. Uh, a lot of these just these have been traditionally used. They work really great. Uh, we have here a celeprin, which is supposed to be um, softer on bees specifically, which is becoming more and more popular. Works really, really well uh, as a caterpillar product. And serves spinosa is another one that works really, really well as a caterpillar product. Um, and then we again our bifenthrins, our permethrins, which have been used for years uh, to manage uh, these guys, as well as acephate which has worked uh, for years really well 
to manage these guys. Um, but of course, when we're dealing with large trees, it's difficult to spray, uh, especially for our spring defoliators. We have a lot of stuff going on. We have rain, we have wind. Uh, in this case here, to get full coverage on these trees, a lot of our caterpillar pests, especially if we think about canker worms and we think about um, gypsy moth, they're starting at the tips and working their way down. So we need to get the top of this tree really and the sides of this tree to get the best control. And of course, with a large tree in a residential neighborhood, um, we, could, we could have issues. It's just, it's gonna be a, a hard uh, thing to get that stuff. So that's where we fall into some of our systemics. So believe it or not, we have a lot of different systemic products that work fairly well on caterpillars. Uh, and if we look at some of our here, we have we have a host of stem injected products. We have Asafe, which we have our Lepitect as a stem injected product, which you could put in just at the time of emergence, and you'll get 30 day residual. We have some of these older uh, technologies here, these two here, namely, which can be used as a micro stem injection and get pretty good. Uh, can move really fast in the tree and do well. We have Emectin benzoate, which actually was originally used in agriculture as a caterpillar product. Uh, of course, we know it as a gray emerald ash borer product, but for years was used as a foliar application for things like cotton against uh, cotton worms, um, which this year we can apply, we can apply the season beforehand as a stem injection and get up to one season, not one to two seasons, but really what we're finding is one season of protection from caterpillars. We have abamectin, which is a racinate, which again can be injected early on and give a full season of protection. And then we have this neem product as a directin, which can be applied as a stem injection uh, in the spring and give you a full season of control on caterpillars. So we have some options here and we'll take a look at some of these a little bit closer. Um, but one thing that we have that's really unique here is we have, um, we have just one option for soil applied uh, injection here. And the soil applied um, is really preferred to some of these other methods because with some of these other methods, we're really only getting, we're either getting a short residual or we're getting a whole year residual. And either way, we have to kind of re-injure the tree every year uh, if we're doing something like this. So, which isn't necessarily um, a negative thing. As we know, a healthy, vigorous tree can heal over these, these injection sites pretty well. But to have an option for a soil injection that works pretty well is kind of unique. And this is this is Lepitec, it's an acephate product. It is the only um, acephate product that's labeled for soil injection throughout the country. So it's, it's really one of a kind and, and very unique in that way. Um, now here are some, some things to keep in mind. I mentioned these two products are, are older technologies and I'm certainly not picking on them, but what I wanna do is I wanna be people aware that both of these come with a danger uh, signal word. Or if you think of our signal words, we have three sets of signal words we have we have caution, warning, and danger. So caution would be the single word that would kind of show us that it's the least toxic, and danger would be the most toxic. So these guys come with danger signal words, and they also come with this kind of precautionary statement that is, uh, it may be fatal if absorbed through the skin, uh, maybe fatal if inhaled. So, you know, again, I'm not picking on these, but these are older technologies, and uh, they do come with some issues around them. Um, but if we're taking a look here at some of the data here, we talked about abomectin as being um, a great product. So we see here, this is the percent infected terminals, our untreated control, we had a 53.5% versus our abomectin treatments where we're getting uh, less than 20%. So this would be considered uh, statistically relevant and a good option in this case as a stem injection of abomectin or aracinate is, is our product that we have. Um, here we have, this is a, a trial that we did last year in Charlotte where we looked at defoliation. So we have our abomectin benzoate treatment. So this was our summer treatment. So this was injected the year before canker worms. This was injected at the time the canker worms came out. And then we have Lepitec, which was also injected at the time that the canker worms came out. And we can see our controlled trees, our untreated trees, we have over 51% defoliation. Versus here, our systemic trees, we have, you know, in this case here, less than 15% defoliation. And if we look, at a picture here in a second, you'll see that's pretty substantial. Now, again, just a word of caution, uh, and this is something that I always bring up to, to clients when we start talking about caterpillar management is because they get excited about some of these, oh man, a whole year season, a whole season of control of caterpillars, which in some cases that might be what you need to do because either yeah, the, the population is so high, uh, your operations, uh, this is the way they fit in your operations. So you, you do have tools here that will give you long residuals. But keep in mind that long residual is not just killing your target pest. And we see your target pest 
you know, when we target right at the life cycle, we're getting great control um, and just wiping out our pests. But keep in mind that if you're using a, a product that has a very long residual, not only are you knocking out your target pest, but you're knocking out all of these other benign um, caterpillars in the process. So you're knocking out a whole year's worth of caterpillars feeding on your trees. And things like oak trees, I mean, oak trees, I probably should have looked up the statistic, but there are a, a whole lot of caterpillar species that feed exclusively on things like oak trees. They get are benign, create beautiful butterflies, create great moths, they go ahead and pollinate our trees. And as well, don't forget about, you know, again, our, our birds. So again, I know many of us are birders. I also know that many of our clients are birders and actually want to encourage birds in their properties. So if we're using some of these long systemics, we're knocking out a major food source for birds as well. So while again, you know, I'm not necessarily advocating against some of these products. Uh, again, you know, abamectin is a product that we have as part of one of our products here as, as racinate. Um, it, it, I always say, you know, again, you know, caution, use your, your best management approach. Um, use that appropriate response um, kind of chart there to figure out, you know, whether or not some one of these long residuals are what you need versus something with a longer residual. It's like our Lepitec. So again, going back to our, our trial from earlier, this was our trial that we put in last year in Charlotte where we have a huge cankworm problem. This is our Lepitec. Uh, this, in this case, it was infused. This was a stem injection. Uh, this is the, the, the purpose of this specific trial was to sample different stem injected products. But here we have Lepitec, uh, where we have, again, less than 15% defoliation in our untreated tree, which we have around 50% defoliation. Um, so just really just a great product. Um, in this case here, we timed it right dead on when we were going to know we were going to maximize the product in the plant, as well as, uh, again, just get as many of those canforms as possible. And the thing with, again, this Lepitec, uh, and some of the other um, the organophosphate type products is they move out of the tree very quickly. So again, we have residual in this tree for 30 days. So again, with something like a canker worm or something like a gypsy moth where we know they're feeding for anywhere between 30 and 40 days, we're going to have that product maximized in the tree while those pests are feeding, and then it simply uh, it burns off. It just moves out of the leaves, it volatilizes um, up into the environment, and it's gone. And then all of our subsequent generations of benign um, caterpillars, or caterpillars will, that will then again turn into moths and butterflies can go and pollinate, uh, again, our, our nice flowers as well as create food sources for our um, vertebrates. So something to keep in mind. Um, here again, if we look at, at Lepitec, this here is um, a soil applied Lepitec. And what we had here is they applied Lepitec to paper birch, and then they plucked leaves off that paper birch and they fed them to gypsy moth in a lab. And what we find here is that one day after application uh, of Lepitec, um, there was enough product in those leaves to start killing gypsy moth, which is incredible. Lepitec moves incredibly fast into the plant. Uh, we say anywhere between five to seven days on smaller trees, up to two weeks on larger trees. When I talk about larger trees, I'm talking about trees 35 inches and, and greater. Uh, we have rates that go up to 72 inches. Uh, so we know we get some great results on larger trees with Lepitec. Um, but again, in this case here with these paper birds, one day after treatment, um, we're getting mortality of um, these gypsy moths here. We go up to 29 days, we are still getting mortality. Uh, but then 61 days later, so two months after application, we can see now that the product is burned out of the plant and we are not getting as much mortality on those uh, gypsy moths. So a really cool targeted way to affect pests greatly uh, but again, it burns off, and then our plant is also going to be protected from our pollinator species. Here we have bagworm. So here's bagworm on honey locust. Again, we know bagworm can be a huge issue throughout the uh, the country. Uh, we look at our Lepitec treatments here. So this would be soil applied Lepitec, and we see here from our chart, you know, we have our application date is June 11th. So this is in July, and we are still getting our percent defoliation is right there, barely shows up um, here. Now keep in mind. Well, then any systemic application, the, the pest still has to consume leaves. So they have to feed on that leaf a little bit before they perish. And so this is where we see here some of this defoliation. Um, here, if we move to, uh, this is September, so this is a long time after our application. It's not that the product is still in the plant. It's just the product works so well at, at killing those bagworms that we just don't see any more defoliation versus our control. So our controls, the bagworms continue to feed uh, for a while until they maximize, and we can see our defoliation here 
versus are treated just because we did such a great job in those 30 days we had product active in the plant, we just eliminated a pest, uh, which is amazing. Uh, Left that comes in two different um, uh, ways to, to apply. We have soil applied. Lepitec, which again I mentioned is the only soil applied acetate that will give you control of caterpillars. Um, and we have some rates here for you. And then we also have a, so again, this would be soil applied as a, a stem injection uh, right up at the base of the tree. Um, again, one packet's going to treat between 25 and 50 inches of diameter, depending upon your, um, your rate there, your pest and the size of the tree. And we can get away with doing very low volume applications because what we found through um, research over the years is that we get a lot of feeder roots or a lot of absorption roots uh, right at the base of the tree. So we can affect a lot of roots that are going to put that product directly up in the vascular system of the tree and transfer it in the leaf right up next to the base of the tree using low volume application, which is really cool. Now we also have a stem injected product, which again, in some cases that stem injection might fall in better to your, to your um, operations. We have some issues, you know, where we don't have a lot of soil volume or for, for whatever reason that stem injection is going to work better for you. Uh, with the stem injection, it does move into the plant significantly faster. Now, again, Leptex moving into the, the plant a whole lot faster than imidacloprid for sure, a whole lot faster than down tetra, and it's moving into the plant within, you know, five to seven days for small plants, up to two weeks for large plants. But with our stem injected method, we know we're getting that product up into the top of the tree within seven days. So if you need a quick knockdown, uh, if you're getting, you know, starting to see a lot of foliation, you were, you were a little too late uh, on sprays or you're a little too late on your soil applications, uh, you can hit it with this trunk injected formulation. It moves into the plant really fast and really starts going to town on taking out a lot of stuff. The other cool thing about Levitect is, again, it has that short residual, but it does a lot. It is the only soil applied product, again, that will give you activity on spider mites. So we don't have anything else in the landscape industry right now that we can soil apply for spider mites. But we can affect spider mites as long as a whole other host of pests with Lepitec. And so I mentioned again, it's the only soil applied product that we have that's going to give us reliable results on caterpillars. Uh, as well as spider mites. It's the only product that we have that's going to affect mites. It also host, affects a whole host of other plant damaging pests. Um, which again, we have Japanese beetles, plant bugs, scales, both salt and armor, as well as some of our, our leaf hoppers. And it offers us 30 day residuals. So again, we're having a lot of issues now with, with, with pollinators, not just butterflies, of course, but bees. We have a lot of standards here that are trying to, um, trying to move some of these systemics away from our toolbox uh, to prevent uh, injury to bees, which is a great thing. But you know, it's, it's really taking away a lot of great tools from our toolbox. So Lepitec, of course, is, it's not a neonicotinoid. It's not a metacloprid. It's not dinotefuran. So, you know, it, it doesn't fall within some of these neonicotinoid restrictions. The other thing is because it moves out of the plant so fast that if we apply after flowering, none of that product moves into the parts where pollinators are going to be. So if we can time our applications for some of these other pests after the plant has flowered, then our pollinators won't come in contact with it, which is awesome. And so if we look at some of our, you know, our pests here, like pine sawfly, Again, we talked about how sawfly can be confused with caterpillars. Uh, the pine sawfly here, we have great results using um, our Lepitec here. This is another soil applied trial here. And uh, we get 12 days after uh, treatment, we have drastically reduced the amount of live sawflies on the Scots pine. If we look at gouty oak gall, we know oak galls are becoming more and more of an issue throughout the country right now. Uh, here we have, some initial data here that shows us that we are getting some activity on some of these oak gall treatments. So Lepitec, when timed correctly, um, should help manage these oak galls by controlling the life phase of those wasps that are in the leaves. So we knock out the wasps that are having the life stage in the leaves, and then they can't hatch and have a life stage to create these galls in the stem. So some cool stuff there. Again, as Lepitec, this is again soil applied acetate Lepitec as a miticide. Uh, here we have Lepitec soil injection matched up against some popular uh, foliar applied miticides. So Lucid is abomectin applied with oil. This is Forbid, we know is another great miticide commonly used, matching right up head to head with one soil applied um, application of Lepitec. This is 27 days after application. And we can see the amount of mites sampled here versus our treatments. 43 days after application, once again, and so, like I said, it's not that the product is still active in the tree. It just does such a great job 
in the time that it's in the plant that it just knocks down those pest populations. Here we have um, spider mite, honey locust spider mite on honey locust. This is 60 days after application. Once again, it's not that the product is still acting in the tree, it's just we hammered that population of mites. Um, and now that product is out of the tree and um, safe for other things to feed upon it. <clears throat> Here, armored scale. We know how armored scales can be difficult to control. Here we have the mean number of live scales per six inch twig growth on Euonymus. And we have our two rates of Lepitec and our untreated control. And you can see the amount of mortality that we had on armored scale with one application of Lepitec uh, versus our untreated control. So really it's just an alternative tool in our toolbox for a lot of species. Japanese beetle on little leaf linden. This is becoming a giant issue throughout the country because a lot of our uh, different um, areas are um, banning neonicotinoids specifically on linden, and we have an, we have label issues now. We have some labels that say we can't apply neonicotinoids on lindens. So here we have a product that we can apply as a soil application or a stem injection application that will give us great control on Japanese beetle. And the cool thing about Japanese beetle from a phenology standpoint is Japanese beetle begins to emerge and feed on lindens after they bloom. So just as those blooms are fading is when those products, when, when those beetles are starting to feed. So we can apply our Lepitec after flowering, so we're not getting any of that product into the flower, so we're protecting our pollinators, and we're affecting our, our target pests. So some really a, a neat option here for treating Japanese beetles on little leaf linden, which is becoming a, a big issue throughout our country because of some of the new regulations coming down. Um, I'll also mention that we have right now, we have a Lepitec starter kit. So this is something that we're offering right now as a promotion. And so you have two options. You have option one, which is for soil applied uh, applications of Lepitec, where for really a stellar price, you get a, a gas powered power backpack, which holds about six and a quarter gallons of water. You get our HTI soil injector, which helps you to accurately dose um, product so that you're getting the maximum amount of product without wasting it or underdosing your trees, as well as a case of Lepitec. So this case of Lepitec will treat anywhere from 100 to um, 200 inches. Uh, this backpack will allow you to treat 100 inches. So when you fill this backpack to that maximum six and a quarter gallons, you can treat um, 100 inches of diameter based upon our protocol using the HCI. So this is one option. And then we have our Lepitec infusible starter kit. So this again would be if uh, stem injection fits best in your operations. And this here again, you get a, a, a unit, or excuse me, a case of our Lepitec infusible. You get a dual 18 inch cordless drill, which is a super nice drill. And then you get our Q-Connect system, which uh, this would give you um, the T's and the dosing bottle uh, to direct inject into the root flares of trees. And again, uh, uh, a stellar price there. Um, I mean, that's worth it just to get that drill and that Q-Connect right there. So some options we have right now to get people going. Um, so to wrap up here, and then we'll look at some questions. Uh, caterpillars are a diverse and beautiful group. Um, I really like caterpillars. I spend a lot of time tracking them down and, and taking pictures of them, and, and I really like them. Uh, caterpillars are key to sustainable environments. You know, again, caterpillars become moths and butterflies that then pollinate. Uh, a lot of different species of plant really are a great role to us. They're a major food source. Caterpillars are a major food source uh, for a lot of our songbirds that, again, we're trying to attract to our landscapes. Um, timing can be key to managing uh, these, these pests. Again, we have some options for long-term systemic control, but, you know, most of the time we want to just maximize, uh, you know, when that pest is going to be active and knowing the species of caterpillar when it is active Cross-dressing that with the growing degree days and phenology so that we can really affect the pest with the, the product the, as best as possible is the way to go. Uh, and again, there are several practical protocols available for managing these pests. Um, it all it depends upon, you know, how it fits into your operations, how, you know, it fits into your, what your client's needs are. And again, referring back to that appropriate response process, how everything fits within your action threshold and, and when it's time to control uh, is really is key to some of this stuff. We have some more webinars coming up. So here is an example of a few. We have several uh, webinars coming up this season. Uh, so here's a quick few going through April. We have more coming on after that. So again, you can go to our website and sign up for these. Uh, all going to be very informal, or excuse me, informative, um, and really offering some great information from great people around the country. 
Um, saluting branches. If you are not aware of saluting branches, last year was our inaugural saluting branches. So we went out and we offered a day of service to over 20 different cemeteries, veterans affairs cemeteries throughout the country last September. Um, and it was such a great day. Uh, again, we had over, I think, 2,000 volunteers. It was a great event. And we're doing it again this year. So this year, Wednesday, September 21st, uh, we're going to be having our, our, our second uh, Saluting Branches event, again, all over the country. So what you can do is you can go to the salutingbranches.org. You can sign up for more information. You can see where your local cemetery is going to be. Um, and we had such a great time last year. And uh, we're looking forward to doing it again this year. Um, and just a few other things in conclusion. As I mentioned earlier, we want to be your partner in plant health care. So we want to offer you as much um, information as possible to make you guys successful out there. So we have diagnostic field guides, which talk about you know, the pest, what, um, what species they affect, about their life cycle, and then offering you practical protocols for treating the pest. We offer opportunity guides, and this would be specifically around our products, so that you can, while you're out there in the landscape meeting with clients, uh, help you to see ways of um, improving plant health and improving your plant health care operations. And then finally, we have these end user sell sheets. So these are things where you can actually, what we can do is put your logo information on these sheets and you can hand these to your clients um, like it's yours. Uh, so these are the tools that we want to offer you because really what we want is we want everyone to succeed at plant health care. We want a lot of happy, healthy plants out there. Um, and we, we really just want to help out in being a part of that. So with that, that is, concludes our discussion. I'll take a look at some of our questions here, but that is my information. If you have any questions following up after this, again, you can always call into our Solutions Center as well with any information on uh, products, protocols, support, things like that. And here I'll pop out our questions here. Let's see if we have, um, see if we have any ones here. And, um, well, it does not appear we have any questions today. Um, so with that then, I will stay on the line here for a few more moments. If anyone else has a, um, a question or a comment, and um, if not, then once again, I, I highly, again, thank you so much for taking time to, uh, to, to join us here in this conversation on this Friday afternoon. Uh, this presentation will be available on our website um, probably in the next few days or so. So you can go to our website, click on education, and you will find a copy of this as well as um, other uh, presentations that we've done throughout the years. So um, again, still don't see any questions, and that is fine. Okay, so we do have a question here that says, how long for Leptec Infusible to get into the tree? So Leptec Infusible moves within the tree extremely fast. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Leptec as a soil injection moves into the tree extremely fast. The, the soil injection of Leptec moves into the, the tree faster than any other uh, soil applied system that we have on the market today. But with the, the um, Infusible, you can see activity within that plant as, as little as, as a one day after application. Um, the active ingredient is extremely water soluble. It moves and translocates through the plant extremely fast. So when we put it right into the vascular system of the tree, again, you will see activity within a day, um, you know, as, as many as maybe five to seven days on a larger diameter plant. And there, I mean, again, something that's 35 inches or larger. So uh, again, it can be a really just-in-time treatment, the infusible treatment for some pests. Um, of course, really good. It accumulates in the leaves. So that's one thing that I also would say about Lepitec is um, Lepitec is basically, it's racing to get into the leaves. So it works really, really great on things that are feeding um, on the leaf, whether it be a piercing, sucking insect or a chewing insect, uh, again, like a caterpillar or a beetle. All right. One more second here for questions. It is Friday afternoon. I'm sure there's uh, many of us that are looking forward to the weekend. All right, guys. Well, 
In that case, since I see no more questions, we'll uh, let's conclude this conversation today. I have 12:55 by my time, uh, which seems like an, a, an appropriate time to release everyone early. Uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, let us know if you have any questions. Feel, please feel free to reach out to me or, again, our tech support line or our tech support email. And uh, we are definitely looking forward to working with you all in the future. And, again, have a happy Friday and a good weekend. And we will talk to you all soon. Have a good one. Bye, all.